Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, a clinical microbiologist and the chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the president of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in laboratory testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, welcome back, Bill. It's great to have you as always. And uh, wow, here we are at the end of the year uh, saying goodbye to 2020 and looking forward to 2021. Yeah, wow, what a crazy year. I'm, I'm joining you again from northern Minnesota, hence the, the lumberjack. Just so everybody knows, it's not the new dress code at Mayo Clinic. It is the <laughs> standard dress code of northern Minnesota. But uh, yeah, what, what a year. I mean, think back uh, for you, particularly, Bobby, as a, as a clinical, uh, in clinical microbiology. I mean, mm -hmm. you just, do you uh, think in the turn of the, at the opening of the year, what we knew about this virus and, and how far we've come? Oh, I know. It's amazing. And, you know, I have some of the major milestones here and we could just reflect on them. So it was actually, of course, COVID-19. That term comes about because it was the very, very end of 2019. Um, December 31st, that China reported this new unidentified virus to the World Health Organization. But then, yeah, it all just went right into 2020. January 7th, they identified it as a new virus. And then very quickly, January 11th, just a, a few days later, Later, China shared uh, almost all of the genetic sequence of the virus internationally so that people could start using that sequence to work on um, the virus and diagnostics. Then our first case in January, uh, on January 21st, and then January 30th, yeah. the World Health Organization declared a global emergency. And I remember hearing all of this, we probably all do, and just thinking, hmm, what's going to happen with this? And I think once we heard about the first U.S. case, I think we knew it was it was here to stay that we were going to be seeing it. Yeah, I think so. It's it's funny though, because I we knew but we didn't know. I mean, now yeah. standing here, you know, because we as uh, you know, for as as a hospital, uh, we're required to have a pandemic plan, and so we review that plan annually and all the things you would do in a pandemic. And you never really, it was like it was like planning mm -hmm. for a tornado. You never really <laughs> thought it was going to hit, you know. And I don't right. even know it wasn't. I didn't hear a lot of people, even at Mayo, saying, oh, we better dust off our pandemic plan. It's like we knew it was here, but I don't know yeah. that we really knew it was here. So yeah, and, early and on, me, I agree. We didn't really know yeah. what the scale of it was going to be. Was it just going to be a few cases and then it would kind of peter out? Well, especially because we had the previous SARS virus um, back in 2002 to 2003, and that just disappeared. Yeah, so that's I think, right. I think yeah. we, and we've had some near misses. So, mm -hmm. and for me, it, it really... First of all, all the confusion in those early days about should we be developing a test? We were getting a lot of pressure to develop our own test, which of course we could not do. Um, we did, but we couldn't actually offer it to patients. We were getting calls from clinicians saying, we, and, and of course at that point, uh, had not received DUA. For me, the, 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 real, uh, the real moment of realization was when we, I was called to the White House to visit with the Pence team as part of the American Clinical Lab Association board the first week of March. Wow. That's when you start, you start thinking, yeah. And even with that, yeah. I think I was probably more excited about the fact that I was going to the White House than scratching my head saying, why am I going to the White House? This must really mm -hmm. be something impactful. So, and you go from there to then the hyper intense focus on diagnostics uh, that, that happened after that. Something that oh, yeah. none of us have ever experienced in, in healthcare uh, writ large, let alone laboratory medicine. And, and well, yeah, and there was a timeline for that, of course, too. You know, we've seen this before to much, much smaller extents uh, with pandemics that um, HHS, Health and Human Services branch of the U.S. government, will determine the need for this emergency use authorization, and then this will be rolled out, and then anyone who wants to offer a test has to receive this emergency use authorization. Um, we've seen that with Ebola, with 2009 H1N1, um, but boy, we really saw that it had a huge impact on our ability to offer tests. Um, that was February 4th when HHS De declared that there was a need for EUA. And then it was February 19th that at Mayo Clinic, we decided to go ahead and undertake that process and develop our own test for SARS-CoV-2. 
And it was this tremendous uh, effort. We pulled together, it was, you know, more than 12 people and it was finished by March 11th. And we did receive emergency use authorization. I mean, that was just yeah. a tremendous undertaking. Yeah, we really, I remember having the phone call with Matt Binnaker. We were at our Mayo Clinic Labs Global Field Staff Meeting in Arizona. Uh, so, which is back when we used to get together for meetings. And so, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then and having those, should we, should we keep working, you know, burning the midnight oil and pulling together yeah. these teams when we didn't know if we were going to be able to get EUA and, and then from there, it, you know, I do think that, and we'll talk about this, about what changes we'll see with COVID, but that whole, even we realized that the diagnostics, the process around that was not designed for taking something that was going to be needed on a national scale immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the immediate, the, just the immediate pinch points um, that, that occurred because, you know, the, this, even though the FDA was very, very, uh, cooperative and getting EUAs approved, it created all these pinch points. And the Roche, we were we were really fortunate to have a relationship with Roche and to be able to get access to the testing uh, as a national reference lab. But you know they had their pinch points, and it's so it was just after that it became an unending cycle of trying to under where trying to get as much capacity out of the system as we could as quickly as we could because there was basically this tidal wave, wave of need that just the, none of the systems in place were designed to accommodate going from the regulatory framework all the way to the manufacturing base globally of some of the things like plastics that are needed for the for testing it, it was pretty it was really amazing yeah unprecedented is a word that's probably been overused but is so applicable this is just an unprecedented situation um, so for our, our listeners and our viewers, since we're live now with video, um, as a refresher, after we brought up our lab developed tests, which many labs across the country did, manufacturers started coming out also with their own tests. And so we had this great relationship with Roche Diagnostics. So we went live with our lab developed test on March 12th and then March 13th, Roche the COBOS test received emergency use authorization. And we were able to bring that live up over a weekend which was incredible, basically working 24 seven. But then many other tests came out, um, different manufacturers, Abbott, Hologic, et cetera. And I remember Bill, you and I talking and we were up to 10 tests at one point by different manufacturers for the same virus. And we're still probably at about 10 tests, maybe a little less, um, just to meet the demands for our patients. Yeah. And that yeah. just isn't something that we usually do as laboratorians. You want to have one good test, maybe two, maybe one that's more rapid and you use it for more point of care. But maintaining 10 tests for a single virus is just unprecedented. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know. I think one thing, too, is that you, we could go on and on about all the fluctuations mm -hmm. and, the, and things that happened over the course of the next nine months in the summer when we really were in shortage. I think one thing, though, that's, that is really remarkable is the level of cooperation that happened during that time. I mean, myself, I was having weekly calls with all the leaders from the reference lab industry um, every week and all of us thinking together about how we could help the, just the nation understand what some of the constraints were on testing uh, and cut regular conversations with, with leadership from the diagnostic manufacturers, which usually didn't, doesn't happen. I mean, it was, there was uh, behind the scenes, although it was probably difficult to appreciate, really uh, on the diagnostics on the clinical lab side, a real, uh, real spirit of collaboration which sprung up, which hopefully we will be able to carry forward with us. Mm -hmm. Well, so looking back, Bell, and reflecting on 2020 and your role as chair of our Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, what were some of the things that you took away from this whole experience and maybe some lessons learned? Well, I think number one um, is that a few things. Number one, that we really have to be vocal about the role of lab diagnostics in driving healthcare. There was an immediate recognition of this, but in some respects, you, you could argue that globally we've underinvested in diagnostics uh, to have the capability to do this. That, that's number one. Uh, number two is that really COVID highlighted a number of things. Uh, about healthcare that need to be addressed. And one was certainly the disparities in healthcare delivery. Uh, I personally became much more sensitive to that than I had been before. And then really uh, interestingly is my position, uh, you know, because I'm both the chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, as well as the president of Mayo Clinic Labs, our reference lab, and really the need for, for someone at the, nat not just someone, but a group of people at the national level that are helping to explain this intersection between science laboratory medicine 
and healthcare. You know, I, I think that Mayo Clinic had the good fortune to be, um, you know, uh, uh, seen as, a, as, a, as an important voice in the national response to COVID um, and, that the, and, the, and, and Mayo Clinic Labs as well, because we really do understand those intersection points and they were all very uh, relevant here as we respond and continue to respond to the pandemic. So, and, and last but not least is, um, just the, just the importance of collaboration, the importance of reaching out uh, and talking to people uh, to, is something that uh, it comes naturally to you and I probably since we talk every week. But, uh, but no, I think that's, that's something we, we kind of lose sight of sometimes. We get so busy in our own spheres that we don't think to create connections outside of that. And those are really powerful. Yeah, well, I would say that the weekly chats that we have here, our weekly huddles, our touch bases with our COVID uh, task force, I think is just so important to keep us all on the same page. So we're not all off going trying to do the same thing at once. And then, of course, as a country at a national level, and I would completely agree with you, the role of testing and the importance of diagnostics in driving healthcare is one of the positive things that I think has really been highlighted with this is that laboratorians and scientists have been at the forefront and the importance of what we do every day has really been emphasized with this pandemic. And of course, you and I just talked about how that's inspiring people to go to medical school, to become physicians, hopefully to become laboratorians as well. So I think that was uh, one of the positive things to come out of this. And again, we can't lose sight. Uh, it's, a, it's a natural uh, point to stop and reflect, but mm -hmm. the things that we are still dealing with COVID and I, you know, that where we can have to, we will have to continue to be advocates for what the lab and the diagnostic world needs to be doing. Uh, I just uh, recently we heard news, for instance, that uh, there are now mutations or changes in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID that might lead to increased transmissibility. I don't know if you've seen that, but. Yeah, and you know, we've analyzed our existing tests for SARS-CoV-2 and it looks like they won't be negatively impacted by the mutations that have occurred, but this is an RNA virus. RNA viruses tend to mutate more regularly than DNA viruses, so there'll probably be more mutations in the future, and I think we're going to have to yep. keep a close eye on that. What are your other predictions for 2021? Well, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so we'll keep an eye I, on the I, science, I, the virus, the vaccine. Yes. That's a positive. I think. I laugh because I, there's a, there's a uh, Professor Tribe is a, a law professor from Harvard. I had a chance to hear him speak once. And his comment was, uh, those who use crystal balls to, to predict the future should be prepared to eat broken glass. But, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but so every, that's, that's my caveat every time you predict the future. But I think we'll see, first of all, just related to COVID itself, They'll, it will be a process by which uh, we need to the, the get er, eradicate this scourge from from being such a global uh, global pandemic. Really dry. You know, we need to learn how to live with and manage. That won't be overnight. The vaccines are important, but diagnostics will continue to be be important. It's not like the vaccines are a magic wand that are going to make COVID go away. Mm -hmm. We have to really stay engaged on the laboratory side to make sure that we, we might have to continue to evolve our diagnostics to deal with changes in the virus. Certainly, there's going to be a lot more tools. We know in the first quarter of 2021, there'll be many more rapid engine tests available to individuals what those can and can't do, the new at-home testing. We had, we've had recently the first uh, home test, self-read test approved. So there's be lots of changes. Again, just like with the in-lab where we had to really help the nation understand how the testing can help, we'll have to do the same now with all sorts of testing modalities and really being a voice. And I think going forward, what we'll see are two things. Number one, a really sustained interest in the role of diagnostics uh, and, and driving healthcare outcomes, and especially now for infectious diseases, because now that we, I think we, we were somewhat uh, lulled into a sense of false security with Ebola and the first SARS virus and MERS that they never really blossomed into a global pandemic as this virus has. And I do think we're going to see a real renewed interest in equity and healthcare, you know, and, and, and making healthcare more universally accessible to individuals, no matter where they are in society. And that's not just in the U.S., but globally, because if there's one thing the pandemic has chose, shown us is that we're all interconnected, you know, that, and, and we have to be cognizant of that. And, uh, and honestly, I think Firstly, as people are going to healthcare, I think it's our mission, right? We're supposed to, I mean, really healthcare is about alleviating suffering. And, uh, and so that's, we really have to be focused on that. And I think there will be a, a real sustained focus on that. 
I think so too, Bill. And I think we've also learned a lot about the process of bringing tests up rapidly. I hope we don't have to repeat that anytime soon, but we've learned a lot in doing that, getting the emergency use authorization with the FDA. And I think, you know, we've all learned a lot about what it takes to get that process going. And I mentioned that because as a clinical microbiologist, I have now seen these pandemics and novel pathogens coming out every three to five years. And I think it's really just reflecting that we're a global society and as new microbes emerge, they're gonna quickly spread around the world. And so we had HIV in 1981 and then SARS in 2002, the so-called swine flu, the 2009 H1N1 influenza in 2009, MERS in 2012, Ebola in 2014. And then of course we've been seeing things like Zika and measles and things that are re-emerging. So, um, I think we're gonna be in this situation, hopefully not to this extent, but we're gonna to continue to see the need for diagnostics and the need to rapidly respond when these new pathogens arise. Yep, it's funny because you know we just talked about our concerns over adaptation of the virus, but I think that we will see adaptation of healthcare as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, healthcare actually has been a field that's been relatively slow to innovate. Um, we tend to err much more on the side of safety, which is good, but mm -hmm. it's sometimes at the expense of advancing healthcare. Uh, and just look this year, in 2019, um, Mayo Clinic did more virtual visits in one day than it did for the entirety of the year before. So our, our 2020, I should say, more one day than the entirety of 2019. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that hopefully will carry forward. I think it will. It'll require re revisiting the regulatory framework around healthcare. It'll involve what sorts of partnerships are created between uh, you know, manufacturers and providers of healthcare and all those sorts of things. But I do think that in many case, instances, if you think about it, people's frustration with healthcare was that it wasn't evolving as quickly as other parts of society. So I think that's something we'll see as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it just took a little push. You know, we're all getting more used to working virtually. And then I think the other big wave of change that's come out of this is at home collection of specimens, but then at home testing as well. Yep. And patients are gonna be looking to that, to be able to order tests and perform them at home and get a rapid result, but still have that connected to their healthcare record so that that result just doesn't go out into the ether. So uh, it kind of kickstarted all of this to get that going. Yeah, I would say uh, the, probably more than a little push. <laughs> I <would say> it's <laughs> pretty yeah. major stuff, uh, you know, and I think that's most importantly as we, you know, get to the end of 2020 and look to 2021 is, you know, all the things that we talked about that happened through the course of the year was through the sacrifice of a lot of people, people willing to work nights and weekends, people mm -hmm. willing to work in jobs they had never done before, uh, people willing to go out when a lot of times it was people were concerned to do so, to even come into work because of the spread of the virus. And so just the, the, the other thing I'll carry forward is just a very deep sense of gratitude. Uh, to all the people who have stepped up during the pandemic and yourself included the way you share information um, and 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 then upside it look how much we get to talk now so um, <laughs> but uh, but that's that really I think that if there's anything that's going to be a bright light for us uh, for 2021 it's going to be that spirit of collaboration it's going to be belief in each other uh, and supporting each other going through this as we kind of uh, come back to some sense of normalcy. Yeah, well, you and I, I'm sure, will continue to be discussing things uh, in the near future on a weekly basis still. Um, I don't know if you realize it now, but we started this in April, and this is our 30th leadership podcast that you and I have done, and our 46th podcast that we've done on COVID all together with you as well as others. So wow, it's been a lot. <laughs> and this is when we, <laughs> we started it at the end of April 2020. Wow, it's a good thing I like to talk. Or maybe not. I know. <laughs> then hopefully people find it. <laughs> no, it's great. That's great. Yeah. And it, honestly, well, it's a privilege to be in a situation where I get to talk to you and then where we and to get to share information. That I feel really I feel blessed to have, to have that opportunity. Yeah, well, me as well. And uh, I echo what you said that I'm just very grateful that we have such an excellent team. I'm grateful for all the hard work that everyone's put into just getting us to this point in this year and just reflecting on everything in this extraordinary year that's happened and happy that um, we've been able to get through this. Looking forward to 2021 with you and the rest of the department, Bill. Me as well. Me as well. Stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.